Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to the, up, the past interviews page on bathgap.com. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. If you appreciate it and would like to support it, um, there's a PayPal button on, on every page of the site. My guest today is Maury Lee. Um, Maury got in touch with us with a rather different and interesting story than many of my guests. Um, you know, a lot of most of my guests, I would say, are spiritual teachers, and most of them have written books and have a lot of YouTube videos and up and so uh, up. Um, Maury. I don't think would consider himself a spiritual teacher, although he is a good writer and he has an interesting blog. Um, but his path uh, was quite different than most of the people I interview. He's never really done much meditation to speak of, um, but he went through a lot of therapy, and including um, primal scream therapy. By I, I believe the guy's name was Arthur Janoff, was it, Maury? Yeah. 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 And um, he got quite remarkable results from all that. So um, we thought that'll be different. And, <laughs> and Maury, Maury is well spoken, good writer. So I think it'll be an interesting conversation. So welcome, Maury. Thank you very much for having me on. You're welcome. Um, I'm not going to read your bio that you wrote uh, because I'd rather you just tell us as we go along about about your life and you know how things unfolded for you. Um, the kind of stuff that you were telling me in that um, video you sent. I think that would be interesting, except in this case I'll have the opportunity to interject uh, a few questions as you tell it. So, uh, where would you like to start? Well, uh, let me give a little background, because uh, I think it's interesting and I, I think it does apply to the way I'm set up. Uh, Back in the 16th century, there was a boy preacher of England, and he's listed in the who, who, uh, who's who, and he was the boy preacher of England. And ever since then, the oldest son in my family lineage became a, a minister, mm -hmm. typically a Baptist minister. So all of the, the people in my background on, on both sides tend to be very religious, very spiritual type people. And it's almost as if I was born with a genetic inclination to, like, search for the truth, whatever, whatever that is. And uh, it, it came down the line to me. And uh, my father, you know, became a Baptist missionary to, it was then the Belgian Congo. And so uh, at that time, in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, if you wanted to be a missionary to the Belgian Congo, you had to go to Belgium and learn French and stay there for a year before they would let you over there because it was a colony. So uh, I, I, when I was eight, I was thrown into French-speaking school in Belgium. And uh, that was very, very difficult for me because I was a really sensitive child and, and uh, easily uh, upset and disturbed and, and didn't fit in. And then after that, I was taken uh, out to the, the bush in the, in the Belgian Congo and only got like the summer there. And then I was taken to a boarding school in Kinshasa, which was the capital of the country and, and is now. And so I was in boarding school and still went to French school. And in 1960, uh, we heard on the ham radio to be at this hill at the top of the village at noon because the Marines were coming in with choppers to take us out. And we got one suitcase per family. And so we went up on this hill and the Marines came in with their choppers and guns out and everything else. And we were evacuated from there to uh, Kikwi, which was a city of a uh, number of miles away, which Belgian paratroopers had just taken over. It was, I think it was called the Simba Rebellion. And they were killing anybody that was educated and killing a lot of missionaries. And so we, we got out just in time. And the family, we went back to uh, Appalachia, where m my relatives lived. But my dad went back to Africa and, and stayed out in the bush and 
got captured by Congolese soldiers and was almost executed, except that he'd been a teacher and some soldier happened to recognize him and said, well, aren't you Mr. So-and-so? And he said, yeah. And they said, ah, oh, he's a good guy. I don't kill him. <laughs> wow. But so uh, that's just a little bit of the, the, the basic background. But so I, 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 most of my relatives, they're just all very spiritually inclined, but uh as a child, I could never, ever, ever buy Western theology and their interpretation of Christ. Even as a little child, it's like the idea that Christ died for my sins was just absolutely repulsive to me. And, of course, being amongst missionaries, primarily, uh, it was really difficult for me to express my opinion because everybody was supposed to believe a certain way. The funny thing was, is being out in the bush a lot, I had the African culture as a counter to the, the Western theology, and I pretty early developed the idea that different cultures have very different ideas of what truth is, or what love is, or what the best way to be is, and and it, it just... So I didn't believe anybody. I figured I'm going to have to figure this out for myself, because... You know, the the missionaries I was around, I didn't believe what they were saying, and the Africans thought something entirely different, and they had witch doctors, and they had their magic that, if people believed it, it worked. If a witch doctor told somebody they were going to die, they usually died, <laughs> I mean, because their their belief was that strong, and, and I saw it. Mm. And then, of course, the Belgians, they think differently and see things differently. They're mostly Catholic, but they don't go to church or practice. So very early, I, I, I saw that I was going to have to find out for myself. That's pretty neat that you were so independent-minded at such a young age. Most kids aren't. They just don't think for themselves. Let me jump in on that, because I, I think that's a truism. But I, for example, about when the kids were all about 10, 11, 12, they all started getting baptized. And so my dad kept asking me, well, when are you going to get baptized? And I said, I'm not. And he said, why not? I said, well, because I said, we're all supposed to be a certain way and believe a certain way. And I said, all these kids are doing it just to please you and their parents and to fit in. And I said, as long as I'm under your household, me getting baptized won't mean anything. I said, now, if I'm away from home for a few years, like when I'm 21 or something, if I decide to get baptized, then it will have meaning. You said this when you were 10 or 11? That's amazing. It's really precocious. And, and so he, he couldn't really argue with that. Yeah. And, and he went, so I've never been baptized. Uh -oh. <laughs> You're screwed. <laughs> I, the, the thing about it was that... Uh, and I only came to this discovery later on, but the whole idea that Jesus died for our sins was, like I said, it was always repulsive to me because I would never ask someone to die for my sins. I, I just could not, it just didn't sit with yeah. me. And later on when I started reading about Jesus and they talk about, you know, he was the Lamb of God, it's like the Jewish culture at the time of Jesus what did they do for their sins? They sacrificed doves and sheep and goats and mm. things. And so when he died, they interpreted the death through their tradition, which was, oh, he was the Lamb of God, and God sacrificed him for our sins. Well, that was just a continuation of that culture. And uh, I, I didn't really, really understand Jesus till I studied Advaita Vedanta, because all those Eastern sages, you know, it's like, from my interpretation, Jesus is saying exactly the same thing. It's just the West doesn't get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The West just doesn't get it. And the and we're very parochial in the West because, you know, most most Westerners we go, oh, those Indian gurus and stuff, they're all pagans. They're they don't know what they're talking about. They're terrible. But if you ask the Eastern they all say, wow, he's one of us. He got it. He understood. So, I mean, who's, who's, who, who, who's got the more open mind? Once I started reading, you know, the Eastern sages, then all of a sudden it's like Jesus really made sense to me. And I could go, okay, 
This, this is what I objected to as, as a child, yeah. was the interpretation that these missionaries had. And you were saying that the and missionary types didn't get the Eastern uh, sages, but the Eastern sages had no problem understanding Exactly, Jesus. and so I, I, I was very impressed that the Eastern sages seemed to have open minds. It's like anything that pointed to the truth, or as they could see that that person understood the truth, they, they, they just had brought him in and said, yeah, he's one of us, you know, he gets it. Yep. But we, in turn, do not give the Eastern sages that same benefit of a doubt. Well, that's and, kind of a I think, contrast between Christianity and Hinduism. You know, the Christians, one of the main pillars of the whole thing is ours is the only way, although I think it's gotten more liberal, the Pope's talking more liberally. But, um, but in the East, it's like, you know, the Christian missionaries would come in with Jesus and, and the, the Hindus would say, great, let's add him to our altar, you know, <laughs> along with all these guys. Exactly. <laughs> and and that is, that, I think that's really, really beautiful. And, and I, I, it's like anything that comes to India just seems to be included into the pantheon. Yeah. And, and it ends up being very inclusive. And, and I, I just really, I like that attitude. Yeah, and I think the reason yeah. for that attitude is in that tradition, it's understood that God is fast, and, and even in the Gita, you know, Lord Krishna says that whoever you are, however you sort of approach me, I'll, I'll you know, I'll accept that, you know, through, so, so it's just very broad-minded, and, um, you know, there are multiple streams of spirituality, and it's just a tendency not to be, I mean, I'm sure there are fanatics and fundamentalists even there, but um, it's, as a general rule, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know what you want. Okay, so, um, you finally got back to the States uh, in one piece, it sounds like. <laughs> and, um, you know, I guess you got back into, into school back here, right? Um, I don't know if you finished uh, high school back here or just started college here, but... Because of... I, I always considered that I had a curse, mm -hmm. and it, it, people think it's funny because I say it, but it's like from early, early childhood, I questioned everything, and most of the adults around me, I didn't believe them. It's like I didn't ever feel like a lot of them claimed to know the truth, but it was really more of a, a belief that they were fanatic about, and I just never felt that adults really understood what the truth was, and I couldn't find it anywhere, and it was very painful. And so by the time I got to college, and I got out of any environment, I mean, I went to college in California because that was as far away from any relative or anybody that I knew as I could get, because I wanted to be free to have my own thoughts and not have anybody say I shouldn't think them. Right. And, but, so it was like being dropped into hell because I had no basis, you know, for believing or knowing anything. And, it, and, and I was in a lot of pain and a lot of mental anguish. And I would look at all these California kids. This was like the late 60s mm -hmm. in the middle of the drug culture. And I would see these kids playing Frisbee on the quad and they didn't seem to have any concerns or any issues and here I was in a lot of mental pain trying to understand what truth was and other people didn't seem to have that issue so to me it was like I was cursed it's like I had this fundamental need to know the truth that I could not escape. It's a good, good I, curse I, to have in my opinion. Yeah but but it, it was it was a drive that it didn't feel personal as far as a, it, it wasn't me being curious. It was like I had to know. And it was a very strong drive. And it, it made me just study and read everything in psychology that I could read and everything in spirituality and ask questions. And it was, it was just a, a, a profound existential search that I, I could not escape. Were you... Would you say you were suffering a lot? Because a lot of times, you did mention that, because a lot of people, if they're suffering a lot, they have a more ardent desire for, for escape. Suffering, hmm. extreme suffering. And I had already decided that I would never get married and have kids unless I could figure this out, because I, I couldn't see any reason why anybody would want to live with as much suffering as I had. 
So it was like I, I, I had to find the truth that would stop my seeking or satisfy my seeking or else really life wasn't worth living. Yeah. And would you say that your suffering had anything to do with your itinerant upbringing, moving from country to country to country, or was it not really related to that? Attributed to it, but I, I think mostly it was a it was a spiritual angst yeah. that I needed. It was I think in my I had an intuition like that there was something that I knew but had forgotten right. and, and some part of me knew there was something out there that I needed to find or relearn or rediscover and and it was of absolute importance and if I didn't find it uh, I was a goner and 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 that intuition was was that was that that drive that I some part of me just knew there was something that I needed to know or rediscover and 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 I had to do it. That's great. And, and it, it felt like a curse. Yeah, it isn't. It, yeah, but it wasn't. In my opinion, it was a blessing, you know, because it 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 bore fruit. You know, it goaded you on. Oh, and you you often bring up, you know, did you uh, with with people you interview, did you get into drugs or anything? Well. I had the perfect opportunity because I was in Southern California in the late 60s mm -hmm. and there was drugs all around and I had friends that did a lot of drugs like LSD yeah. and uh, they would never give it to me. Huh. They, All of those people were like, you're already too far out, you're already very, very, very intense and uh, we're not going to be around if you take anything. Interesting. And the, so they literally wouldn't. Hmm. Uh, I, I I don't know for sure if I would have taken it, but they were like, "No, we're not even going to give you the opportunity." Interesting that your friends were so responsible. Usually, in people in that scene would just give anything to anybody. <laughs> yeah, but obviously you came across to them as intense. You know, you, you they your inner turmoil must have been evident on the oh, outside. It was, it was, it, it was pretty obvious. Yeah. Pe people would often tell me that I was very, very intense. I'm not real intense now, I don't think. No, you don't I'm come on. very, very, very laid back. It's like the, the me now and the me then is like a different creature. Yeah. Were you always sort of, um, you know, cornering people and dumping your, your, your whole questioning them? Yeah, what's life all about? All, all that stuff. I would literally go in, down the hall in the dorm and say, now you got to understand I'm not normal, <laughs> you know. And, but I think maybe I had a good cover or something because people would go, oh, no, you're, you're not. But they weren't feeling the pain that I was feeling. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was just extreme, extreme suffering. Mm. Interesting. Um, so then... Uh let's keep moving along so there you were in college I, I can kind of relate to what you're saying I w I've gone through periods like this myself but it sounds like you were even more it was even more extreme for you um, and persistent um, so how did you get out of it I'm sure it wasn't oh, oh, step yeah. okay there there was a long period of time when I didn't even want to go out and walk mm -hmm because my self-esteem or whatever was so so low that I thought who am I to be walking and killing all these germs with my feet like everywhere I would go where I would walk I was very very upset that life was set up in such a way that just me walking to class or something would be killing all these microbes or maybe an insect or something Sounds like you might have been a Jane in your past life <laughs> And it was ex an extreme concern. So it's like, how do you not be in pain all the time if you feel like you're killing all these innocent beings and 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 uh, it's not your choice, but you're doing this? I mean, so uh, that's just an example that, that it was uh, it was just extremely painful. Yeah. Did you put two and two together and become a vegetarian at that point? No, I never did yeah. that. Just because I of the killing explain. involved, you know. And, yeah, yeah. Huh. I, I didn't. So you made it through college, I presume. 
Uh, yeah, that was that was that was hard, but I I made it through college. Were you s kind of searching around? I mean, late '60s, there was you know Yogananda, there was Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, there were you know some things one could get into. Were you checking any of those things out? No, I I, I really didn't. And and uh, did you have a sense that spirituality might be the solution to your suffering, or did you not really grok that? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, I think at that time I probably equated any kind of spirituality with the same crap that I've been raised uh -huh, with. Right. And and so I I, I was looking mm -hmm. in a lot of other places, but I I was just always very afraid of any authority that claimed to know the truth and this truth is what you need and you need to have it and if you don't then you're screwed yeah, yeah. and so i just avoided all of that so when did you first start actually doing anything such as some kind of therapy or something to try to assuage your your pain i, I read everything i could in psychology and self-help books and all this and I was an extremely intellectual person. It's like I've always had a, ver a real strong bent towards abstract thinking, mm -hmm. and, and I really enjoy abstract thinking, and the more abstract, the better. Uh, so I read, studied all the different kinds of psychology, and I literally determined that the only kind of therapy that I wanted was Gestalt. And I won't talk too much about this, but, but I just want to make it clear that that I studied all these kinds of psychology and said, I want to do Gestalt. And the reason was is because it was experiential. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to go to somebody and be analyzed and give me a label and say, this is what's wrong with you. But everything I could read uh, by Fritz Perls and the people doing Gestalt therapy, he just worked with, well, what's going on with you right now? What from the past, what pain from the past that's repressed is showing up right now, right here. And in Gestalt therapy, basically, they push you into whatever that pain is you're avoiding and, and, and force you to experience it. So I found an, an ex-Presbyterian minister that had been kicked out of the, the church because he was too radical. And he was a very spiritual person and he practiced Gestalt therapy in a completely radical way. Like, if you went to his group, you, you could risk everything. It's like if you got into so much stuff that you went schizophrenic and had to lock you up, he would allow that because he had a very strong sense that ultimately uh, facing all the dark side and all the, the dark stuff that's in people would bring us to health and the first time I went to his group the very first time and we did our little introduction to make sure that we were present in the group the first thing that he ever said to me was that well there's nothing wrong with you that killing a hundred people wouldn't cure what do you mean by that that he said that because basically what he was pointing out is that I was a very very angry person oh I see so so obviously he wasn't recommending it but he was saying that you, you have so much stuff you need to you, you right I see what you mean and that it's like I got yeah. it and I'm like this this guy sees me uh -huh. because the level of anger that I had is not something that you want to show yeah. and right there without just me, first time in the group, just making a short introduction. But I think at that time, my voice was really constricted, mm -hmm. and I had a lot of twitches, and I was really nervous, mm -hmm. and he just nailed it. And so, so you weren't actually expressing anger, but he picked up on your kind of repressed anger. Yeah. And so I started going to his groups, and uh, uh, I didn't want to be analyzed, and I was afraid of my own intellect. I knew my intellect was really, really strong, but I would also knew that I had been for years since college trying to escape the pain that I had by outthinking it. I, I really tried to outthink my, uh, 
my feelings and that didn't work and his point of view was well you can't escape the stuff that you've repressed because it's always going to be interfering with your life you got to feel it to let it go and so because i didn't want to be analyzed or 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 come to the group and say this is what i want to work on i just started recording my dreams mm -hmm. so i would record my dreams and when i would go to a group he would work with dreams and so I would role play the parts in the dreams and the dreams were usually expressing all kinds of issues that I had and working on them brought up all this pain and I was able to let it go. It just sort of dissipated as you worked through it. Yeah. But, yeah. And it was, it, it was very intense, but feeling it was the only way I could let it go. Were other people in the group getting similar results? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. It, it was very, very... I thought it was very good. Yeah, it's interesting that we'll be talking more about therapy in this interview, but it's interesting that a number of spiritual authorities and teachers these days really advocate it as an almost necessary adjunct to spiritual practice, um, and you know can point out examples of people who didn't engage in any sort of therapy and advanced a lot spiritually, but ended up still with a lot of unresolved stuff. I think that. I think that's really, really true. And I, and I think when I wrote to you, what my point was is that I've watched a lot of Bat Gap, Bat Gap interviews and, and read a lot that they say the, the point of meditation is to, to quiet the mind. And meditation is something that I never really did. I, I tried it many, many times, but I never got anything out of it. But by doing the therapy that I did, it, it really quieted my mind because as long as you have a lot of repressed material that's, that's denied, you project that out onto the world and onto other people. And so you're not living in reality. You're not, you're not seeing people as they are. You, I, like I would go into a room before I went through therapy and I would think, well, this person thinks this because they're dressed like this, and this person would probably react to me this way because they're dressed in golf shoes and a yellow shirt. And, and so I'd walk into a room with some people, and in my head, there would be all this stuff going on, all about all these people and this and that. It was just like a circus, and none of it was true. It was just my own crap. Yeah. So, but, but, I was just going to say, some people use the metaphor of, like, if you, all your stuff, you know, is like a beach ball that you're trying to hold beneath the surface of the water and it wants to keep popping up and you have to keep exerting all this effort and it creates, creates turbulence in the water because you're like struggling around trying to keep the beach ball under. Yeah, yeah but if then you can de deflate the beach ball somehow, then it's just sort of easy going. Yeah. Very good analogy. Yeah. I like that. That's, that, that's, so, so just to get into the primal scream part is like I I worked with this guy on and off for about ten years. This uh, pres ex Presbyterian dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was a real. For example, he never would get a license. He didn't have any kind of therapeutic license. He'd studied Gestalt therapy, and he was known to be one of the best in this area. But uh, he hated the idea of a medical model, and he thought like getting a license would turn it into some authorities would have control over what he did or what people did in his groups and he was like completely erratic it was like no this is personal that this is spiritual and it has to do with uh, nothing medical he just thought this we're trying to get to a healthy mind and this isn't medical this is spiritual and 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 so that's the way he was but somewhere during that time, I read the book, The Primal Scream by Arthur Janoff, yeah. and when I was done with it, it's like I was totally convinced that I was still sitting on a lot of pain. Yeah. And, and so when I went to the group that night, I, I was laying on the floor in front of a couch, and we were trying to do the introductions where you just say what happened with you that week so that people could get a feel for where you were. And uh, when he came to me and he just said my name, I just started wailing. And 
it, I had no expectation what would happen, but I started wailing, and my stomach was rolling. Uh, it was just like a very loud wail, and it went on for like 45 minutes, and it was just, and, and the the whole basis of the majority of the pain was the pain that I had never been left alone. And what that boiled down to is, as a child, I was never felt like I was free to just have my own thoughts and my own being. I always was taught I had to think a certain way and feel a certain way and act a certain way. And so I felt like no one ever left me alone. And yet, even as a child, it seemed like you were quite independent. They were wanting you to think a certain way, and you said, no, I'm not going to think that way. But I guess it's... So that yeah. was it. It was a huge conflict for me, but that, that was a, a, and after that, uh, any time I would see a smell, a smell, or see a scene, or something that reminded me of something in my childhood that had pain related to it, I would start feeling this pressure at the back of my head, and it would start getting very intense, and I would know that I had to get back to my apartment because some pain and some stuff was wanting to come out. So I go back to my apartment, lay on my bed and let it come out. And I can remember sometimes I screamed for an hour or two and I literally lost my voice. And when I went back to the therapy the next week and I couldn't even talk, the, the therapist literally said, you know, you're, you don't have to go that deep into it or you don't have to be that intense about it. And I was like, Pfft. It's coming, and I, I got to let it out. Yeah. And, uh, Intensity was your middle name. <laughs> People who are old enough may remember that John Lennon and Yoko Ono got into the primal yep. scream, and they, there was a lot of screaming on some of their albums. Um, but yeah, it, go ahead. Yeah. It, wor it, it, wor it worked for me. I'm not say recommending it for anybody else. I'm just, I'm just trying to say this was my experience. Yeah. And, and after it, people literally told me that I was completely different. Hmm. They, they said that you used to be a real jerk. You were always very critical. You were always arguing with everybody, questioning everybody. Uh, you were nervous all the time. Your voice was high and squeaky because of the tension. And, and after that, I was just completely relaxed. Hmm. A couple of thoughts came to mind when I was listening to your, the video you sent us. And... Um, one is the question of it's sort of a court cart and horse issue. Um, it seemed like you were you already had a head of steam built up pretty well, and um, you know whatever you tr tried, like this therapy and then the, and just reading the book about the primal scream, it um, you know immediately began to ha be effective for you. And um, another thing, and it's kind of related to the head of steam point, and and related to what you just said about what you'd feel at the back of your neck. Um, and then you'd have to go back to your apartment. Um, I kind of get the feeling you, you were undergoing some kind of kundalini awakening um, that, uh, I don't know if you understood it as such, but there was this energy kind of rising up in your body that was starting, that was clearing through things. Um, does, there any, does that resonate with you, what I just said? Except my feeling was is that I started having a lot of kundalini experiences later on like much a long time after that yeah but they might still already have been percolating or starting to starting to build up like i think you know i think i told you that you know i had a heart chakra opening which oh, yeah well should which, we talk about that now you want to do some other things first before we no, get to uh, it go ahead uh where were we well, you were, Basically, you had been, you know, you did the you read the primal scream. You went to the therapy session. You wailed for forty-five minutes. I think I heard you say that afterwards. They, the guy said, "Do you want to talk about what just happened?" He said, "No." <laughs> the thing was, is what I needed was to feel that that repressed stuff, and it was so meaningful to feel it, and put me back in t in touch with a norm that was prior to all that pain that I was trying to escape and, and repress. And so that, that, that experience was enough. I didn't need anybody's opinion of it. I didn't need anybody's comments on it. Didn't want it, didn't need it. And then after that, I didn't go back to the group and do any of that primal stuff. 
It was just coming, just so I just go to yeah. my apartment. Yeah. How long yeah. did that phase go on where you were going to your apartment and screaming? Years, but the intensity, you know, got less and less and less, and and uh, eventually it pretty much stopped. Hmm. Just so on its own. It, 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 yeah, it was a process, and what was there that needed to come out? It was a. I think it was a very natural process. It's just not something most people get into. Yeah, it just happened to you. Um, and so, um, you know, take us through those two or three years. You were doing this process. You, you, you were just feeling freer and freer and freer as you went along. Yeah. And 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 it quieted my mind because when there's when when that stuff is is let go of. You stop projecting and you stop trying to outthink it or maneuver, you know, yourself to to not feel it. So my mind just got quieter and quieter and quieter. Yeah. Does anyone still practice primal screen therapy? Huh. I don't know. And um, I don't know if if this is something. Let me see what you think. But is this something which you think could other could be applied to other people? Um, other people could somehow do this themselves, or do you think it's just something that happened to you? And, and it's not like if somebody, I mean, goes into their room and starts screaming, it's go, it, it's going to happen for them. That would be kind of just a superficial um, imitation of what you are actually going through almost involuntarily. Uh, boy, that's 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 a hard question to answer. Uh, I don't think just going into your room and. Uh, here, my thinking about it at the time was that I had all these authority of figures around me that were oppressing me and telling me, no, you have to think like this. You have to feel like this. You can't have these thoughts. You can't have these feelings. That's not right. Blah, blah, blah. So I had all these authority figures conditioning me. So I think that I didn't have a strong enough will of my own to counteract that. So by going to this therapist and giving him th that authority or him being the authority, he would push me into what I couldn't like break through to. And so by him pushing on me, I mean, I, I, I take responsibility for using him, but I put myself in a vulnerable position and he would push and then this, these feelings would come out. So, I don't like I said. I haven't. I don't follow primal therapy. It, it just worked for me. And uh, yeah, and that, uh, and, and and that's all I can say is it worked for me. <laughs> and I don't follow it, and I don't recommend it. But uh, it was just the channel through which you got some big release, um, and so. As you progressed through those two or three years doing this on a regular basis, was it like every day you would go and no no no, it was uh periodically whenever something it, came it, up it, it, yeah it, it you know your mind is very associative, and so I'd be in a situation or something or see something or experience something that was associated with some repressed material. And that association would immediately click in and say, oh, there's pain related to this, mm -hmm. and I need to experience it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it almost sounds like it became kind of a second nature for you to um, turn around and face any pain, which became, yeah, because so, some people might try to blot it out or run away from it, but you kind of developed a reflex where you would face it whenever it started to come up and just work through it. I tried to escape uh -huh. it, you know, so it's like, but there was too much pain there for me to live, so I don't think I had a lot of choice once I discovered that that actually feeling the pain was the way to let it go, yeah. and then I was like, okay, if this works. <laughs> and so would it be fair to say that, um, you know, after those two, three years, the pain not only did you not go screaming in your bedroom, but the pain had pretty much dissipated and you were more or less pain-free? It was very, very much less. Yeah. And did you also feel at that point more autonomous and, and um, you know, less um, 
put upon by, by what others were thinking or saying. Yeah. yeah. Huh. But 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 that wasn't you know that really lessened the suffering. Yeah. And and I think when people meditate, in my case, meditation didn't work. But in a lot of cases, from what I see, when people meditate stuff comes up that they didn't know was there so sure. I, I just think it's the people are set up differently and for some people meditation will start to bring that stuff up and they can deal with yeah. it in their way in my case uh, something else worked. yeah and also when you say meditation didn't work it's sort of like um, there are different ways of meditating I mean I tried to meditate uh, before I formally was instructed and it didn't work for me either and then I instruct I was instructed and it worked so people um, you know sometimes a little bit of guidance or instruction might do the trick I think you're probably right yeah. maybe if I'd had some TM or some instruction it would have worked for me but yeah. well, you found something which did which is great yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's different it's interesting um, so um, Again, now, now that this, now that you went through all this, and we're we're not we're certainly not to the end of your story, but you you went underwent a huge catharsis with this therapy and with the primal screen thing that happened. Um, have you contacted or been in touch with uh, other people who had a similar path, or are you kind of unique in that regard? No, no. I've I've always been very. Uh, I needed to find the the truth and what works for me. Yeah. You know, I never had any sense that uh, I'm going to get this and then I'm going to go out and tell the world what I've discovered and and uh, say you need this. It was always just very personal. Yeah. You know, I had a problem and I needed to solve it. Yeah, and it worked. But uh, so you really never had a teacher or anything either, aside from this therapist. You you just kind of did your thing. I have to say that because of my intellect, when I would read, I would literally literally have experiences from reading. For for example, I got into Krishnamurti accidentally. I, I would go to the bookstore and I would find a book that was close to what I was believing at the time, but I would always choose a book that was a little further out or a little broader from where I was to read and and eventually I could observe what I was doing and I'm saying you keep reading books to, to break up your mind and expand your mind maybe you just need to let everything go and at that and so I went to a bookstore and I saw Krishnamurti and I had never heard of him but I liked the title of his book because it said you are the world mm -hmm. And that didn't make any sense to me because I didn't know anything about non-duality. So I buy this Christian ready book and I go home and it was in the evening and my wife and kids had gone to bed and I'm reading this book and I get halfway through and all of a sudden I started feeling this overwhelming forgiveness and just a huge feeling of forgiveness and it was, you know how sometimes people cry at weddings or you cry when you feel good? So I could tell I was going to cry, so I went to the other end of the house in the bathroom and sat on the floor. And all of a sudden, I just cried. And I cried for a long, long time, but it was this wonderful feeling of relief because whatever Krishnamurti was saying, I mean, he was talking about let go of all tradition, embrace the unknown, and all that. And I finished that book, and then for about two or three years, I was read everything Krishnamurti wrote and ordered even books from India that weren't in print in the U.S. and read those and so it was just a real Krishnamurti fan mm. for a few years. It's kind of cool how, um, not receptive, that's not the word I'm looking for, just how, how, um, how easily various influences bore fruit for you, you know. Most people wouldn't read a Krishnamurti book and go through all those we have all experiences and, and ha go through all those transformations, but it seemed like whatever you tried, you, something happened for you. I, I, I can remember when I was reading Krishnamurti, my, my, my intent with reading was 
I would love to be able to say what he says and think what he thinks. So what is the space that he's in that what he's saying is true for him? Yeah. So I, it was like trying to read between the lines and go, what, what's the space? What is this, this sense, this feeling spacious place that he's coming from that he can say these things? Yeah. So, uh, but, but like I said, I'm a very... Well, when I took uh, Jungian tests early on, I came out as extremely intuitive and extremely thinking. Mm -hmm. So I would say in the in the Indian tradition, I would be called like a, a nana or a nani. Yeah, nani. You right. know, the, yeah, that that path. Of course, I didn't know anything about that. But when I read, uh, like if I read Franklin Merrill Wolf, which I just reread his book, The Philosophy of Consciousness Without an Object, it's like I feel the space from which he's coming. And it just, it affects, in other words, I read, but I have an experience. Yeah, it's cool. You, I experience. You sort of entrain with the author and begin to have his experience, yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's, so. it's an interesting point, because sometimes I sort of poo-poo poo the, the people who, you know, fill their heads with knowledge, and then I, I've often said that they mistake that for experience or for for realization, but you know, perhaps that's a little unfair because I think some, I think knowledge is is knowledge and experience go together and um, are somewhat correlated. And in any case, both are necessary uh, on the path. And I think I've read some blog posts of yours which said just that, that you can't go really, really far on one leg without the other leg taking a step. You know, and. Um, but it's interesting how well correlated they seem to be for you. Like you'll read a book, and the knowledge elicits an experience, um, and I think that's really healthy and 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 uh, desirable. Yeah, and maybe I'm just lucky to be that way because um, I've had a lot of mystical experiences and uh, you know experience of ecstasy that just was too intense for me to even handle. Uh, for example, I think uh, I used to rub my daughter's back at night so she could go to sleep, and I would put a Krishnamurti tape on on my uh, cassette recorder to listen to Krishnamurti, and I'd be rubbing my daughter's back. And one time, I just felt so much love for my daughter. And listening to Krishnamurti at the same time that I just poof off into this uh, ecstatic place. And it, the ecstasy was so intense that, you know, when my ego started to come back, it was like, uh, you can't stay here because there's no you here. You know, uh, if you stay here, you'll just sit in a corner and stare at the wall for the next 30 years and you won't take care of your kids or do anything because this is so good. Yeah. And so... It started to go away, uh, but as as that ecstasy left, you know, people that have had this uh, uh, mystical experiences know this, that you get this knowing, it's like a, a download comes to you, but it's not verbal, it's like it's, it's instantaneous, and what came to me was this, this statement, and it said, you have always been surrounded by absolute beauty and you always will be whether you know it or not mm. and it was a very strong so it was like saying that this everything around you is just absolutely beautiful and it always has been and always will be and the last thing was even if you don't know it or see yeah. it and I, and, uh, so I, I just uh, you know, no, no, so I have a, an experiential side, but it seems to be really prompted by reading, by, by just reading. Yeah, it stimulates. I, I guess another way of looking at it is since you have um, such a lively experiential base, um, since the, the, it's like the ground is fertile, you know, um, seeds which are dropped into it sprout well. So you have this, you know, experiential development which already correlates with a lot of things you might end up reading 
And so when you do read them, it resonates with something you're already experiencing and um, kind of enlivens it or, or makes it more clear. Whereas somebody who didn't have that experiential base could read the same book and not get as much out of it. <laughs> yeah, I, that's the feeling I get, that you're kind of cooking inside experientially and so all these, um, th th when you read something, it's obviously not just flat philosophy, it's, it's something that resonates with your own experience. It doesn't feel, if I read philosophy, it doesn't feel just intellectual to me. It, it, it's, it's like philosophy comes from a human being and we do it because you know we 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 have subjective meaning and we have subjective space that we're coming from so philosophy should you know if if it's good it, it for me it just ha hasn't like franklin merrill wolf people might say he's overly intellectual but i read him and and i get into this really sweet space yeah, yeah. Well, people might say Shankar is over the intellectual, but he he was coming from a, a level of direct experience, and and you know then also trying to articulate it in in a way that others could get. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the point we're making here is that knowledge and experience go hand in hand, and both are important components of the spiritual path. And some people may lead more with experience, and knowledge will catch up, and some more may lead more with knowledge and experience will catch up, but one way or the other, you want to kind of keep them both uh, lively as you, as you go along. Yeah. yeah. So what are some of these other mystical experiences you've had? You mentioned you had a heart chakra opening. Would, would that be an interesting one to talk to? Uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, I was walking with my wife and our dog and we were taking a lot, and it was in the summer, and we were just taking a nice walk. But as we were walking, I started saying to my wife, What is this tingling? What is this electrical field that I'm feeling? And I kept telling her, I said, My fingers are tingling, and I'm feeling uh, energy going down from my shoulders to my hands, and, and uh, this just kept getting more and more intense and so we turned around and we were b walking back towards home and and I can't explain this but I started ha I started feeling really tired and I had this thought you know if you take another step you're dead you know and it kept recurring if you take another step you're dead and then all of a sudden it was like my 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 whole body was being blown up from inside. It was like somebody had stuck a giant air hose in my, in my chest and was blowing me up from the inside. And I was, it was an energetic expansion. And I literally fell to the ground. And the, the energy was a whole body energy of, of expansion. And, and, and it was very, very scary because the energy was so intense. And, uh, you know, those kind of experiences, you never had them before, and so you don't know what they are. And uh, it was just really mind-blowing and very frightening. But, but it was like I was being blown up from the inside and my body was expanding, you know, to include the universe or something. Huh. And uh, my wife tried to flag down some cars because I was laying on the grass next to the road, but nobody stopped and so she said well should i go get the car and take you to the hospital and you know me being a guy going to the hospital or saying there's you know i need to see a doctor is the last thing i would ever do but i was like yeah i think maybe i should probably go see it uh, go to the hospital so she ran home and got the car and took me to the hospital and uh, one doctor after another came in and examined me and everything and they could not figure out what it was. They they pretty much all agreed to, oh, we don't really know if it's a heart attack or not. But I was sort of giddy and joking around with the doctors, and it's like, if I died, I could have cared less. But they said, well, we'll keep you overnight and test your blood to make sure there's no heart damage. And So I spent the night in the hospital, and they did their blood test, and the next day they are like, we have no clue what this was. We don't know what happened. You're not sick. You're not ill. There's no heart damage or whatever. 
And so I go home the next day, and I was still sort of dizzy, like my mind had been blown up or something. It was it was just different. And so the only thing I could do is like, you know, thank God for the Internet. I started looking up my symptoms, but and, and what kept coming up over and over again at different sites was saying, well, that's the, the symptoms are sort of like called a heart chakra opening. Mm. And I wasn't big into chakras. I didn't study them or anything else. But apparently, from all I can tell, is that was a heart chakra open. Yeah. Have you had many things like that? Or that was the biggest, most dramatic? But there was about 20 years ago, I would be sitting at work. And I can remember, especially one day, I'm like, oh, my God, why is water running down my legs? You know, I was like, did I pee my pants or something? <laughs> And so I'm feeling my legs and looking down because I, it felt like what's like this really uh, pleasant, you know, wonderful feeling of water, cool water trickling all down inside my legs and around my body. And it was just circulating and it felt very, very good. And at times breathing was like ecstatic, just like every breath. And and there were periods of time when uh, I would be into these experiences and they would last for a few weeks or a month and everything was, everything was extremely, uh, things were so pretty and gorgeous to me that looking at a fish in a fish tank, I would just be like in ecstasy. Or if I rode my bike in the, in the park, everything would just be so beautiful that I would cry. And I'm not in that space now, but... But I had a, I, I can't even remember them all. I just wanted to make the comment about b ecstatic experiences or extremely blissful experiences and so on. I think a lot of times what happens is there's an initial, w when an experience initially dawns, there's a contrast. And it can seem, you know, really flashy or overwhelming or dramatic or profound or something like that. And, you know, maybe a year later, you've actually totally metabolized that experience. You've integrated it, stabilized it. And you haven't lost it, but there's no contrast anymore. So you're not even aware of it or, or anything. You've just kind of adjusted to functioning at a different level. Um, but it's just that initial sort of uh, breakthrough thing that, that is flashy. Like maybe when you jump into a swimming pool and it feels cold initially, and then after a few moments you're not even aware of the water temperature and you're comfortable. You're absolutely totally right on them because... I, th I, th I, I think you really nailed it there because I know that now things that people react to and people think are terrible and I, I just I just take it all much more in stride than I used to and things just don't affect me the way they affect other people and I suspect that you're right because the calmness that I feel most of the time and the peace that I feel all the time is not something that I see in the people around me, but to me it feels normal. Yeah. And so I get irritated with people that are always stressed out and reacting to everything because to me it's not necessary. Uh, but they can't help it. Uh, but they can't help it, and uh, I just wish they had the peace that I had. Yeah. When you, um, so you, you had gone through all that therapy business and the, and the primal scream thing, and you were screaming, and then that tapered off. Um, sin, uh, how long ago was that, r roughly, would you say, since you? Si so a long no, time actually. ago. And so have you have you sort of done anything intentionally by way of practice since then or has it have you just been kind of on automatic and the thing has just continued to carry you along and all unfold at its own pace pretty automatic mm -hmm. and carried on at its own pace as far as practice I, I it doesn't feel like practice to me but when i look at myself and say what what the hell have you been doing <laughs> I would have to say that the only thing I can come up with was is a, uh, of contemplation. Mm. And, and I will take an idea and, and not, not trying purposely, but just the way I'm set up, 
I'll take an idea and it'll just be in the back of my mind. And every situation that I'm in, I will say, a part of my mind goes, okay, this phrase or this attitude or this uh, intent, how does it relate to this situation? Mm -hmm. How can I embody this here? It, 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 if, if I've realized something, how does that apply to my daily life? And I think that contemplation just goes on continuously for me. So I would guess that's a practice, but it's not something that that I have to try to do. It's just, it's a sort of a natural. Yeah. It's sort of like, a, like, I don't know, like you're chewing on something and you just keep, keep chewing on it until it's all chewed. And then prep, then you take another bite and chew on that. I can relate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's certain ideas that I get kind of fixated on and I'll just kind of, I'll bring them up often and people, you know, say, why are you bringing up the same thing over and over? And I'll say, well, just cause I'm still working on that. And, um, you know, and you work through various levels of it, and eventually it kind of gets resolved somehow, and then maybe you take on a new one. Uh, and I think that the, the, we, as we evolve, it's like the stuff that was so important to us and really let us take a step up the ladder, once it's resolved and we get it and we let it go, it's like you can look back and look at that attitude or or phrase or whatever it was you were thinking about and it doesn't even see, seem significant anymore yeah. and it's not that it wasn't at the time it's just that where you are now it's like that doesn't even apply and seems like child's play yeah like learning to ride a bicycle probably doesn't seem significant anymore but it did when you were learning a bicycle riding here's here's a funny or something that i noticed so I, I'm a bike rider, I think you are too, and so I'll often ride my bike for an hour and a half or so at a time. But when I go out and ride and I come back, I don't have a sense that I rode the bike. I just have a sense that there was bike riding. Yeah. It, it doesn't feel like it was me riding, there was just riding. It's sort of, it didn't used to be that way, but but now it's just like, I don't have a strong sense of I do things. It's just like things happen, and I see this person, this body doing this. But yeah, I bet you get that with just, most things, right? But well, not just bike riding. Notice it with the bike riding because I used to feel like, oh, I did my bike. I rode for an hour and a half. I did it, and you know. And now it's just like no, the bike riding just happened. Yeah, I get that most of the time myself with most things. It, it's sort of the whole authorship of action question, you know, that cover, covered a lot in the Gita and other scriptures. Um, yeah. And you don't have to try, you've just lost the authorship. And it's, and you get used to it and it doesn't seem odd to you, but, you know, all kinds of motivation and stuff just is gone. You still do things, but it's it, there just doesn't seem a lot of personal involvement in it. You know, it's it, it's 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 just strange. Yeah, and and regarding motivation, I, I don't know. In my own experience, I find that I'm very motivated. I mean, I have all kinds of ideas and projects and things that I want to do, but um, but the, the doership thing is is kind of light and. Um, so it's not like you become apathetic and you just sit around and twiddle your thumbs. Right. <laughs> but the, just the sense of me doing this and I've got to, that, that kind of dissipates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and just like doing this interview, you know, it's like it happened and yeah. we'll see, we'll, you know. But It's like I've never been much to promote myself. Right. It, I, and I admit, I've never tried to be saintly. I've never, you know, uh, really wanted to be somebody or something. It was just, this has all been just a very personal pursuit that I seem to be born with and, and had to follow. Yeah. Well, you know, the subtitle of this show is, you know, Conversations with spirit ordinary in quotes spiritually awakening people so and part of the intention of the show is to convey the notion that spiritual awakening is kind of a universal thing everyone 
uh, has as a birthright, really, and there's not necessarily anything extraordinary about someone who has had some sort of awakening. It's, shouldn't think that they're special and you're not, and it'll never happen for you. That's part of our intention in, in getting these interviews out there, to you know, give examples of people that others might be able to relate to, and uh, you know, and there's still greater confidence in them, too. That's I know in the, in the tradition, especially from the East, they say that you can't really make a lot of progress without a teacher that you sign on with and accepts you as a student and you do that thing. Uh, I can't really say that I've ever done that. It's like any teacher that's, that has videos out there or has books out there, I'll, I'll read and study, study them. And, uh, but I, I've never been to uh, like satsangs or adopted a single teacher that I say, okay, he's my guru. Uh, at different times, different people meant a lot to me. I can read Krishnamurti now and, and I don't even know what I got out of yeah. it. But you got something. Yeah, at the time, uh, it's something incredible, and now it's maybe somebody else who rocks my boat. Yeah, well, I think there are exceptions to every generality, and um, you know, people tend to want to sort of make gen make generalities absolute. You know, say you need a teacher or you don't need a teacher, or it's the end of the guru age. You need a guru, and you know, there's all these sort of conflicting statements that people make with a cer certain degree of adamancy. Uh, but I think there's there's a lot of individual variation, and and one size does not fit all, and it's it's just really hard to make universal prescriptions. Yeah, and you're uh, you're a good example of that. I mean, you know, the, the stuff you've gone through in your life. Yeah, I, and I think it's really good what you're doing, especially when you just have people on like like me that's not a teacher that's just been doing this for, the, for their own spiritual development or their own peace of mind because I think there's a lot of people that people don't know about that have made uh, tremendous you know personal progress and growth and and, and uh, may even be realized and nobody knows about them because they're not talking. Yeah. It's very true and again that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this show is to bring some of these people out of the woodwork and I think probably I've just you know scratched the surface or seen the tip of the iceberg. There are probably millions of people around the world who have had significant awakenings. In fact, I often hear from people who had had one and were really freaked out by it because they had no idea what it was. They thought there was something wrong with them. Um, and then they, they start listening to these interviews and they think, oh, this is a good thing. And there are other people like me. <laughs> I think it's good for, it helps people out to know that. Yeah, I, I think Bat, Cat, Bat Gap has probably relieved a lot of people's fears. You know, like you've mentioned uh, Suzanne Segal before. Right. Uh, you know, where her consciousness, uh, yeah, her consciousness was like above her and behind her head and it freaked her yeah, out. she couldn't find a sense well, of her personal self. Yeah, but if, if she had had access to, to, to what we know, she, she probably would have found peace and, and acceptance of that and not felt so uh, out of whack. Yeah. And, and luckily for me, I had read so much and studied so much that uh, uh, when I started having experiences, I was like, oh, I've read about yeah, I this. this, this I, I haven't lost my mind. <laughs> well, the ironic thing about Suzanne Siegel, uh, who wrote the book Collision with the Infinite, if people want to check that out, is that she had been a TM teacher and she had been on long courses and she'd heard all this stuff, um, but then she kind of drifted away from it for a few years. And so when she had this sudden awakening, she didn't put two and two together. It was kind of like her understanding that she'd gained um, didn't correlate with the experience she was having because a concept is really hard to match with an experience. Like you can gain understanding of what a mango tastes like. I use this example often. And, you know, you know. It's totally different than when you actually taste one. The, the, the understanding never really came close to the experience. So she was freaked out and it took her about 10 years to adjust and 
and it's kind of plug in some understanding, which I guess she eventually got from Jean Klein, that made her relax into it, allowed her to relax into it. Yeah. yeah. I just opened my, my laptop here because I was reading some of your blog posts um, as I was traveling home from the SAND conference, and um, there, were, we, uh, there were a whole lot of points that you write about in your blog that I think could be the basis of an interesting conversation, each, each one could be. Um, but there are a few that sort of jumped out at me, and maybe I can scroll through and find a few. Um, here's, here's one thing, some paths may be more complete, you said, was the title of one of your posts. You said, people with a little spiritual knowledge think because they had an experience, they are awake. Most likely not. The experience is a pointer, like the proverbial finger pointing at the moon. Typically, a mystical experience or tool will arouse curiosity. This is the beginning of the path, not the end. So that's a common theme of you know, people sort of dis jumping to the conclusion that they are finished. And um, maybe you could uh, reflect on the whole notion of, are we ever finished? And there's also the whole theme of seeking, 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 and then the, the seeking energy relaxes. But does that mean, is that the end of the journey, or is that just the end of a phase? I, th I think when s someone has a, a mystical experience, uh, they're often mind-blowing and really profound and uh, maybe ecstatic and they may last for a while. Uh, the problem with those experiences is that they go away. And I think some people think because they've had a mystical experience or two that they're realized or they're enlightened and they put up a shingle and <laughs> they're going to go out and teach. And, and I don't think... In many cases, they, they don't have the whole story. Uh, the only thing I would say that, that stopped my seeking was uh, when I finally realized that I am that, and I know that I am that, uh, that pretty much stopped the seeking. But I totally agree with the point that you've been making over the last year or so from what I gather on in interviews is that even once you realize you are that there's still a lot of development that can go on after that and it does and it's like I think even the 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 Gita or or some of the Upanishads mentioned that once you realize that that you don't need to do a lot of effort after that because the knowledge does the work or the realization does the work. And my point about experiences, and we discussed this a little bit earlier, I've been thinking a lot lately about the relationship between experience on one side and knowledge on the other. And so I think if you have a mystical experience, it's probably not going to last. And a lot of people have a mystical experience and then it, it leaves them and they think, oh, I was enlightened and I lost right. it. Well, that's a misinterpretation, I think, of the experience because the experience, I think, is, an, is a pointer. And it's saying that, you know, everything is one and, we're, and you can relax because everything is one and everything's taken care of. But then the experience goes away and you think you've lost it. Well, I think the experience is just trying to point you to gain some knowledge or, or extract some knowledge from the experience to realize that you are that. And for me, it's more important to realize that you are that. And then whatever experience you have or don't have is somewhat irrelevant because you have this deep, deep sense of peace because you are that and everything's taken care of for example worrying about death you know if you realize that in essence you are that and you always have been that and always will be that then your fear of death is just much lessened because it's like yeah there's going to be a change but you were that and you are that now but you're going to be that afterwards <laughs> so it's okay yeah yeah. No. So I, I, I and I and I I prefer teachers that 
or at least uh, like what I try to do is, you know, not being a teacher, but at least I just try and be very clear about this was my path and this is what appears to be true t- for me, but I'm not going to hold up a, a banner and a sign and say everybody should see things the way I see it or do what I do because I think that causes a lot of damage. Sure. Yeah, there's a line from the Gita that says something like, knowledge is the greatest purifier. And um, I think you're kind of an example of that. It's, um, you know, uh, how would you contrast, just speculatively, how would you contrast your sense of I am that or you are that with the sense that you, uh, you know, might have gotten 40 years ago if you read that line and it was mainly in your head but not in, in your experience? certainly read that years ago, but... didn't strike home, huh? It didn't strike home, and for many, many years, and I had a lot of mystical experiences, a lot of ecstatic experiences, but uh, for a long, long time, I thought that uh, enlightenment would be an experience that I would have, and the experience would be such that when I had that experience, I would know that I was enlightened. Yeah. I mean, that, that, and I think a lot of people have that attitude, but I, I don't, I think maybe it's possible for somebody that happens, but I think for the majority of people, and at least in my case, it's like the experience was not it, that what had to happen is that the, the, the statement from the Gita and the Upanishads that you are that has to be understood in such a way is that it's like, best way to say it, like it drops in your heart or your being identifies with that statement so it's not just a thought that you can think about yeah. and say, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. It's, there's, a, there's some kind of a shift to where you read it and you go, yeah, uh, that's absolutely true and, and I know it. Yeah. And, and that's where I think the realization happens is when you, you, you know it, but on top of that, it's like somehow there's this other aspect that says, and you know that you know. Yeah, it's sort of like a, well, we've been talking about knowledge and experience. This is sort of a knowing that kind of encapsulates both. Um, it's yeah. not just a, a concept, it's somehow in your bones, you know, it's in your heart, as you say. Um, and then, then there's no question of doubt or, or vacillation or anything, it's just sort of part and parcel of your, your orientation to life. But, but then you still have your, your personality still there, sure. the conditioning that you've got is still there. So I've heard you talk quite a bit about embodiment right. lately. And the people can interpret that differently, but the way I see that is like, uh, you realize that, but then the person that you are, the, the jiva is still there with all its BS and crap and things that irritate you and whatever else. And so I think embodiment is, is well, I'll call it a practice, but or you just have to contemplate about it. It's like, okay, now that I realize I am that, how is that going to affect my behavior? Uh, am I acting in accordance with what I know or not? And I'd say a good portion of the time, or most of the time, I'm not. You're not, or, or, or mean, other people aren't. I, I'm not. Uh-huh. You know, I'm not living up to what I know, yeah. and and so, so you know. Uh, I'm not saintly at all in that regard because I've realized something, but do I feel like I live up to it or that uh, uh, the complete effect and transformation that uh, ultimately that could lead to, you know, am I there? Well, no. Yeah, that's a good admission. Um, and it's a, I think it's a wise admission. Um, and it's a distinction that a lot of people don't make. Um, that, you know, they, I don't know, you're parsing it out with a lot of clarity here. Um, and I think that, in my perspective, 
there's a, a vast amount of um, territory that can be traversed in terms of you know, that initial realization that you are that and then really fully embodying it in all phases of your life because there, there's just so much transformation that, that can take, th th there's room for so much refinement and, and clarification and transformation in our whole relative structure, in our whole personality structure, our nervous system, our senses, all those things. And, you know, physiologically even, those things don't transform overnight. Uh, neuroplasticity is the common concept these days. It does, the, the brain just doesn't become a different brain <laughs> in 24 hours. Uh, but it does become a different brain eventually, and they're, they're able to study that. But it, it takes a while for the, the physiology to transform, and I'm sure that's also true of the subtler aspects of the, our, our makeup, you know, which um, are nonetheless real. Like I find myself reacting, you know, especially to my wife and not behaving, you know, without irritation or whatever. And it's like, I just see it. Yeah. So I think that realization stops the seeking, but that's just the beginning of the transformation of what you can get to. And I think the realization and the stopping of seeking is, is really sweet. A significant milestone. It, it, and it's very, very, very significant. But that, I would say that's the beginning. You know, it's like the search is over, but that's just the beginning of saying, okay, I realize this, I know this, and look at the behavior of this thing. Yeah. You know, does it, does it match? Well, no, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So do I, do I want to like, you know, be hard on myself or be down on myself about that? No, it's just the way it is. But at least I have that in mind that, you know, uh, I know this. And so when I behave certain ways, I can look at it and say, well, it's not in alignment with what I know. Yeah. So, so there's room for growth there. Just being aware of yeah, that, call yeah. it mindfulness or what? Just being aware that you're not living up to what you know is 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 gonna hopefully you know change your behavior so that you do become more in alignment with what you've realized. But I think you've talked before that that's probably an infinite progression of development that you can have. Yeah, you know, no, it's an interesting as long point. As you live. I mean, it's um, I mean. You know, not everyone would necessarily agree with what you just said, but I do. Um, and there have been, you know, I've, people I've seen actual posts on the internet of people insisting that there is no correlation between awakened consciousness and behavior, that, that, and that it's sort of um, unrealistic to expect there to be. Uh, and, but I think that may, maybe the correlation is loose, and, but, and maybe awakened consciousness in and of itself isn't um, sufficient to bring about a, a thorough transformation of behavior. Maybe there needs to be a, you know, more um, intentional culturing of ethics and um, and more self scrutiny and um, you know just kind of being more impeccable, as Carlos Castaneda's teacher would put it. Um, he said a warrior has time only for his impeccability, and it it, it puzzles me sometimes that one can be a person can be so awake, so radiating consciousness, and yet kind of oblivious to certain aspects of his or her behavior, and um, possibly be possibly even be rationalizing that behavior as um, as you know acceptable or legitimate because they are awake. You know that you can't really understand me because I am I'm beyond human you know assessment. And I, I think people get into trouble when they start thinking that way. It lacks humility, it lacks um, self scrutiny, and, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I saw your interview with Ken Wilber, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I agree with everything that he says, but I liked the fact that he was making a point of the fact that someone can realize they are that and their behavior. Can be quite different. Yeah, it talks about lines and, of development, and, and that that the realization may be at a very high level um, uh, on that side, but 
say the person hasn't ever done any therapy and hasn't ever taken a good look at their dark side, yeah. which, which we all have, and if they haven't looked at it or don't admit it, uh, then the, the, their realization can, can, or at least they can take that as permission to behave any way they want. Yeah. Or they're in a power position, you know, being a spiritual teacher, and, and they don't consider anyone to be their peer, and therefore they don't really take constructive criticism well. Um, and, and the students sometimes can, can um, facilitate that by regarding the teacher as being beyond their, you know, their ken, and uh, you know, not questioning the teacher or challenging the teacher because they assume that he knows something they don't, and, and therefore you know, they, they don't have the authority or right to, to question. They kind of undermine their own discernment and discrimination. It was, isn't there a famous statement with a Buddha or something that said, don't put any head o above your own? I don't remember that one, but um, I, I know but, another one from the Buddha. He said, don't believe something just because I say it. Or, you know, just, yeah, just, you yeah. got to go by your own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing for, for what is realization is like, it's like, who is it that, that needs to feel like, oh, you know, I am that. How how that's realized, obviously, can be very different for different people. But it's no one on the outside can can say you got it. You know, they they might tell you that, but it's like somehow something has to happen in the person themselves. That's the aha moment. Yeah. That, that that because I don't care what anybody else thinks about whether I've realized something or not. That won't give me peace. It might like make me feel good or boost my ego. But who who is it that, that needs that needs that satisfaction, the understanding that stops the seeking? Well, it's the the person that's seeking. Yeah, you know. I mean, you're the one whose doubts have to be dispelled and exactly and whose understanding has to be solid and whose experience has to be solid. Yeah. Huh. There's another point you made in your blog, which is somewhat related to what we've just been saying. I mean, you made a ton of, we could go on for days talking about all the points you brought up in your blog, and I'll be linking to your blog from, from that gap if people would like to read some of this stuff, but I kind of like this one. You said, no, everyone is not already enlightened. And, and you start out by saying the crap about everyone is already enlightened causes a lot of botched progress on the path. Um, so although everyone and everything is the self, to say everyone is already enlightened is a misuse of language and a lack of understanding. So, I mean, if we say everyone is already enlightened, that includes Adolf Hitler and all you know, people who are suffering from mental illness and every, everything else in the world. Um, so it kind of renders the term meaningless. Um, and yeah, I, I, I bet you could reflect on this for us a little bit for a second here. Oh yeah, I I'm a real because I'm a writer mm -hmm. and I spent a lot of years writing and and I've done a tremendous amount of reading. Words and the definition of words become really important. Yeah. And there's a lot of sloppiness in spiritual language. And so although you can say everyone in this world, including Hitler, <laughs> is awareness, you know, or is that, it's like that doesn't mean they're enlightened. You know, enlightenment is like fr freedom for the individual and from, and from the individual. So... Uh, it's like, yes, we are all that, because we're all one, there's only one reality, so we all are the essence of that, but realization is, is very personal in that you realize that you are that. And there's a paradox in that, because once you realize you are that, it's like there's an identity shift, and it... it the gestalt means the, the, the play between foreground and background. And so before realization, the foreground is the personal I, the ego. You know, I'm doing this, I'm living my life, it's my will, it's my way or the highway, blah, blah, blah. But the shift is, is the person still there, but it realizes that they are that. Mm -hmm. And so when... People say everyone is enlightened. I think what they really mean is that everybody is that awareness or whatever you want to call the absolute. 
there, you can't get away from that. But that doesn't mean they're realized. No, I mean, by that logic, cockroaches are enlightened, you know. But the do cock, do cockroaches know that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's one thing to sort of know that, you know, intellectually, that that is the ultimate and reality. It's another thing to have that be part and parcel of one's actual living experience from moment to moment. All right. And, and people like to uh, inter, inter equate and inter exchange consciousness for awareness. And I like to make a little bit of a distinction and say awareness is like the blank movie screen on which everything can appear. As soon as the movie starts, then there's consciousness of what the picture is. And, but awareness isn't affected because it's the screen. Mm -hmm. So I like to make that distinction that awareness is the blank field, the, that which can accept everything and become conscious of anything. But the consciousness is the content. It's whatever object appears. And I think it would be helpful if more people would say consciousness is the content and awareness is the absolute clear field in which everything appears. Yeah. But that's just a personal picadillo of mine or whatever. Well, however we want to define our terms, I think it's a good... Um it's a worthy motivation to want to standardize terms so that we're, we, know, we can communicate with each other about these things. And I think there's a lot of progress to be made in that area, um, you know, um, because otherwise we're, it's like a Tower of Babel thing where we're talking and people are understand, understanding different points. And, you know, I don't, I don't think the spiritual territory is as well mapped out as some other territories of human experience, um, such as, you know, I don't know, chemistry or something. Everyone agrees on the periodic table. And all chemists, all chemists would say, yeah, yeah, I agree on all that stuff. But all spiritual people wouldn't necessarily agree, agree on all the tools, all the terms and terminologies and about all the various types of spiritual experience and states of consciousness and all that. And so it's kind of the wild, wild west in a way in terms of our you know, understanding as a culture of what, what we're actually talking about. See, I, a thought just came to my mind. It's like, you know, what are we using when we investigate the self? You know, when we, we become spiritually uh, inclined to say, you know, answer the big question like, who am I? And uh, I, I think an important point to make is, is that I see Advaita Vedanta as a science. Yeah. And when, when I read it, it's like, it is a, it is a, it's extremely logical mm -hmm. and very precise in examining and interpreting, you know, our experience of everyday life in such a way that if, if you study it, you, you, it's very difficult not to come to the conclusion that they're pointing to. And I just like to say that when a scientist is in the lab, and he's <clears throat> looking through the microscope and he's uh, trying to prove a hypothesis and he's taking measurements and all that. The main instrument in the room that's being used is the human yeah, mind. It's true. And people s forget that and they think that science is this very precise measuring, you know, tool and, and, and put it up on a pedestal. And, and they forget the fact that all of this examination and, and everything in science that's looked at and investigated is investigated by the human mind. That's, that's, that's the factor that's the most significant. Well, when someone starts doing meditation and looking inside and examining who they are, they're using exactly the same instrument. So if it's done right and precisely, I think you can call the spiritual search. Uh, it can be a very scientific thing. Oh, I'm I'm really keen on that point. I mean, if you watch my presentation at the Sand Conference from 2015, I, I I really go into that a lot. But it's something I think about a lot. And I mean, it's an interesting point you just made that whatever instruments they may be using, scientists are fundamentally using the human mind, the human nervous system. That's that's kind of the the common denominator of all instruments. They have to be using that, otherwise they can't use other instruments. Yeah.
people. I find it also interesting that so many realized people tend to read uh, quantum physics mm -hmm. and relate to it and find that it's pretty much in agreement with the Veda Vedanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find the same thing, you yeah. know? It's like I, 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 quantum physics to me is saying the same thing that, that, uh, that uh, Gita is saying. It seems the same to me. Well, actually, a lot of the founders of quantum physics, Niels Bohr and others, actually studied Vedic, some Vedic literature, <clears throat> read the Upanishads, and they, you know, they made statements about the, the primacy of consciousness and, and so on. Um, I just want to touch a little bit more on this science thing and, and the human mind as being fundamental to it, because if a scientist is not developing the mind as in terms of developing consciousness, and, and yet that's the the sort of fundamental tool which he must use before using any other tools, then in a way he's handicapping himself and, and um, preventing perhaps the full depth of understanding that would be possible if the mind, if consciousness were fully developed. And it's, silly, it's interesting how petty and narrow-minded scientists can be and how unscientific they can be in you know, adamantly rejecting things which are, to their understanding, outside the purview of science. Um, and so it's, it's kind of resulted in this clash between science and spirituality and the rejection of, you know, the, the, the insistence that physical universe is the foundation and consciousness eventually emerges from, you know, from physicality. And I think they've got it all backwards and I think that the future of science will necessitate um, switching things around and understanding consciousness is primary, but that's not going to happen unless scientists explore that experientially. Like the elephant in the room? Yeah, yeah the elephant in the room is the fact that you can't put science up on a pedestal as a separate thing because the fundamental instrument is the human mind. Exactly. So that, that you know, it's like Science is often treated like a religion, like it's this objective thing out here that we can worship because it's objective. But all of science is only a result of the human mind. Yep. And so that elephant tends to get ignored and say, well, science is this objective thing and it, it's got a much sounder base than spirituality. And that's just BS because they're excluding the human mind yeah. from being the one that's making the hypothesis and determining the measurements and everything else. So I think it's just as valid to do uh, 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 an investigation into yourself with your mind as it is to do science outwardly to the objective world. They're both on the same footing. Yeah. And I would, I would add that I think that the reason science has gotten us into so much trouble, you know, with the, created the possibility of exterminating our, <laughs> ourselves, is that scientists have failed to develop the full potential of the mind. Um, so they're like kids, you know, playing with guns or something. Uh, as the, the science lacks the sort of um, wisdom uh, to properly manage the powerful tools and technologies it has developed and so that's really the, the need of the time is to develop that wisdom on a mass scale so that we don't wipe ourselves out and uh, you know so that all these technological blessings can truly be blessings and not mixed blessings yeah yeah, yeah we, we we our our spiritual maturity and 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 uh understanding that we're all one needs to catch up with the technological development and it's it, it's not there we're pretty far behind but hopefully it's happening you know and there yeah. there does seem to be some kind of spiritual epidemic taking place in the world and you know hopefully it will sort of you know become solid enough in the nick of time to <laughs> create greater balance in the world because um, yeah. And we're we're all doing our bit, you know, as best we can. Yeah, and I I think there's like you said, I think there's a lot of people out there that have made a lot of progress and are pretty spiritually evolved, but they don't talk and they don't 
Yeah. Like in my case, I don't really talk a lot, but I, I blog. And yeah. Well, your blog is really and, good. And I've, I've enjoyed reading as much as of, it, of it as I've been reading. And uh, yeah, again, I would recommend that people do it. Check it out. And that's really basically all you have to offer. You're not making videos on a regular basis or anything. It's mainly your blog. No, no, I'm. I'm. I'm pretty much of a, a loner, you know. Yeah. I. I really enjoy myself, and I'm retired, and I can be totally self-entertained <laughs> all day long, just, you know, fixing my locks or the playing with the garage door or, you know, fixing whatever I think needs to be, and just reading and contemplating, and, and I'm totally content doing that and happy with just. The very simple, ordinary life. That's great. Um, in terms of your blog, do you have a thing on it where, like, if people want to ask you a question or if they would like you to write, yeah, they could comment or they see, they they'd like to see you write about a particular thing or something, they could make that suggestion. Uh, I don't think I have that. Well, they could if they left um, a comment. You'd see it. Yeah, but if they left a comment and asked, then I, I would, okay. or if they emailed me, I Good. would. Um, do you want me to put your email on, on your BatCat page? Okay, I don't think you'll get inundated. I, I did that with a friend, Steve Briggs, recently. He only got a few emails from that, so it won't necessarily be a, a flood. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like doing this video, I figure, you know, if somebody resonates with what I have to say and feel like I might be of help in some way, then I would be glad to correspond with Great. them. But, you know, that's the extent of my, uh, my motivation. Yeah, but because I think there's, there's lots of really good, excellent teachers out there that teach all over the world, and there's, they're very good. Yeah. So, Although know. I would, you know... In my, in my opinion, some of the things you write and say show greater wisdom than some of the people who are pretty famous teachers. I think in some respects you have a, I mean, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, but there's, there's a lot of stuff that I think you state very clearly, more so in my opinion than some other teachers who are, you know, kind of famous. So, um, well, so it's good. Uh, clar clarity is something that I really like, yeah. and clarity in words, and, and that's why I would like, I wrote that blog, No, Everybody's Not Enlightened, is simply, well, let's be clear about this. What are we really talking about? What do we really mean? And to try and say, when people say everyone's enlightened, what they really mean is everybody is that. Right. Everybody is awareness. But enlightenment actually happens to an individual. The paradox is when it happens to them, then they no longer really are the individual. Yeah, yeah. So it's very paradoxical and it's almost impossible to write about, but I think you can have more clarity than what we see in a lot of books and statements. Like, because there's a lot of teachers even that say everyone is enlightened, and I know what they mean, but it can be easily misinterpreted. It can be very confusing, yeah. 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 And, and I, would, I would just like to say that you know, I've had my path, but, you know, if somebody really wants to know what, say, non-duality is or realization, it's like the traditional Upanishads and the Gita, it's all there. It is. And, you know, it's all there. So if, if someone wanted to know what to do, I'd say study that. Yeah. And I think this is a general attitude. You know, I would encourage people to do what you've been doing what I've been doing also, which is just, you know, if this is important to you, then keep your attention on it, you know, I mean, you know, fine, do other things, ride your bicycle and fix garage doors and do, do sports or whatever you want to do, but um, make, make this a priority in your life because that, that really has an effect um, to do that. Not everybody has your dedication to like doing something every day like you meditate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really admirable. Uh, in my case, I didn't, but I did contemplate. Yeah, you're doing all the something time. every day, just a little. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't really a conscious practice, but contemplation is a very. Um, 
it will have an effect if if you if you just take something from the Gita or some phrase that somehow resonates with you and you think I would like to experience this or understand this and just put it in the back of your mind and compare it to like I mean I worked a regular job in an office eight to five for years but like when I would ride the bus to work every day I would uh, have spiritual texts on my phone and so I'm writing, I spent an hour every day on the bus, so for that hour I was reading, you know, the Bhagavad Gita or some other text, and then I would also read it at night, and th but when I was at my desk at work, I would be a concept, am I reacting or performing in a way that's in line with what you know, this uh, spiritual idea is and, and am I conforming to it? And if I conform, conform to it, does it affect my work life and does it make me, uh, my work easier? And Yeah, does, so, does the rubber meet the road or, you know, or are you walking your talk? <laughs> like me, I think most people find out that their rubber doesn't meet the yeah. road, but just being aware of that, can can will make you see that you need to do better or maybe you could do better or how could I do better and then apply that um, here's a question that came in from Dan in London um, people are watching live there have been over a hundred people on watching most of this uh, here's what Dan wants to know he said Anything that one experiences through the five senses is imbued with the consciousness from which it arises. I often notice the beautiful lightness of everything that I experience through the senses. As an experiment, I might often look at an object and ask, what, what's it made out, out of in this moment? And I notice the lightness behind it. It works with any object. What do you think about this and, and what importance do the senses play in realization? Well, the main thing I would say about the senses is that if if you look at them and and and, and study them, all the senses are just an interpretation. Mm -hmm. You know, what whatever the thing is in itself, what whatever that energetic thing is that's in this soup that we're in, our senses are just an interpretation of it. It's just a reality created by our senses. Yeah, they're like filters or something. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so the thing in itself, whatever that is, is not known to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know some people talk about, you know, this is just all hologram in the mind, mind of God. And I, I, I would tend to agree with that. Some say it's an alien and, video game. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, so I don't know if that's answering his question at all, but I'm very aware that, uh, you know, people take reality to be, or the reality of objects in the world to be what their senses tell them it is. And I'd say no. Uh, that makes our form work in relationship to this energy field but it's all just an interpretation and, and it's just our reality, but it, it's just, everything is just an interpretation of what's really there. What I might say to Dan, based on his experience, is that, you know, you were saying earlier, you know, you are that, I am that, um, but also the Upanishad goes on to say, all this is that. And so I think Dan is experiencing, as he's beginning to experience the, um, the that, that um, the objects are essentially, they're not just the superficial appearance, but there's, they are consciousness having taken a form and he's beginning to experience them in terms of that consciousness or in terms of the self and that's the, that's the way unity dawns until eventually everything is seen in terms of the self. Like uh, when I think about what everything that I see is, it's like I see everything as aware or, or conscious because when you think of an atom and it has electrons how do those electrons know to stay in their particular 
groove circling yeah. around the the center. It's like they're aware because they know how to stay in their place. And if uh, something comes close to them that has a maybe a negative charge or something, then something jumps. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awareness or some level of consciousness. So I, I can't find anything in the universe that isn't aware on some level. So the whole thing is just aware and conscious yeah. from top top to bottom. I agree with you, and I often think that way myself. And, and it's not like the electron says, oh, something's coming near here, I guess I'll jump now. Uh, it's more that the, the electron is behaving in, in perfect accordance with uh, all-pervading intelligence and, and is aligned with that intelligence and just operates according to certain laws of nature that are embedded in that intelligence or that are aspects of that intelligence. Right, so whereas we may have a higher level of consciousness to where we feel like we're making a choice, mm -hmm. the electron isn't making a choice because it doesn't have that level of subjective feeling. Yeah. But you can't say it's not aware because it will jump, mm -hmm. you know, under the right... It's, yeah, it's not some and, random little billiard ball that's just going to do any old thing. It's, it's, um, it's, it has a certain... There's a, there's a saying in the Gita, creatures act according to their own nature. I think that applies to electrons as well. They, you know, they have certain laws that they abide by, and the, and, and the, the whole universe is orderly because everything is acting in accordance with some more fundamental laws, uh, or I guess laws is the best word we have here. Um, but, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, you know, and that brings up the idea of you know people have feel like they have choices and they make decisions, and I've thought about that for years. And oh, a long, long, long time ago, I I had a very distinct feeling that that I didn't have free will, mm. and I can remember discussing this at lunch with people from work, and oh my God, their response to even saying that we might not have free will, was, you know, like one of the guys says, if I didn't think I had free will, I'd go home and take a gun and shoot myself. And so I thought, wow, it sh shows how much uh, ego is involved in this um, uh, desire to feel like we have free will. And... But free will is a hard thing to 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 define and clamp down on because, you know, where I am now, I would say, well, I have free will because I am that and I created all this. So obviously, ultimately, I'm totally free. But as a human being, if I look at the choices that I make, I can say, yeah, I made a choice. But when I really look deeply into choice, I'm not sure that it's free will, mm -hmm. you know, so... Yeah, you've written blog posts I, about that, and people have written books about that, and they've argued endlessly about that for hundreds or thousands of years, and I don't think you and I are going to resolve it right now, but... Uh, but um, I think it's a matter of what level you're operating on, or what, you know, there, there's a level at which everything is cosmically ordained, and, and there's a level at which relative perspectives come into play, and... Uh, on that level, you have some wiggle room. I mean, you're not free to just go fly to the top of Mount Everest, but you are right, you are right. free to sort of make yeah. choices within a certain spectrum that you that you operate in. Um, and then there's another level at which the whole point is moot because nothing happens and nothing ever happens. So it sort of matters where you take your stand. Yeah, yeah, and that brings up the idea of karma because what I've noticed in people's lives is. If people make choices that are in line with Dharma or the universal rules, it seems like their field of choice expands yep. Yep. and they get more and more choice. But if they don't govern themselves, you know, and, and make choices that are counter to Dharma, it seems like their future choices start diminish, and the next thing you know, if they can't govern themselves, they'll be in jail where, where the guards govern. Yeah, very good point. I, you and I think along similar lines. I've often thought about that and said that and whatnot. It's like I, I said a minute ago, we have wiggle room. Well, you're, you're, the scope of your wiggle room increases if you make the right choices and diminishes if you make the wrong choices. Yeah. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, cool, so we solved that one. Free will is all sorted <laughs> out here. <laughs> I wish. Nobody needs to write books about it anymore. Oh, and then the other thing is, is that I've been thinking the last week or so about. Um, oh God, I'm gonna lose my thought here. Oh well, it'll, it'll probably come back. Um, uh, that often happens. You sort of, as soon as you stop thinking about something, it comes back to you. Well, I'll start. I'll start making some wrap-up points, but then as I do so, okay. uh, if that point that you were going to say comes back to you, does it have anything to do with free will, or is it a totally different topic? We'll see. It left. Okay. Um, all right. So you and know, I have been talking. We've been going on about two hours, and I really enjoyed talking to you, and could surely do it all day. But you know, these interviews are sort of like a, you know, a taste, and so people have had a taste of your life and your perspective. And they, if they want to delve in more, they can go to your blog mm -hmm. and um, and read. Uh, the, do you have, do you have a thing that on your blog where you get notified when when a new um, r a new thing is posted? Yeah, I do. And uh, okay, I should. If somebody puts a comment on there, it should get to me. Or if somebody emails me, then no, I mean, do you have a thing it. where readers get notified when you post a new thing? I think they can sign up. Okay, good. Yeah, I might do that myself because I like reading what you have to say and. I, I, I subscribe to a couple other blogs where I, I always feel like I learn something when I read them. So I encourage people to do that if they want. <clears throat> um, and um, as you said, they, they can get in touch with you if they feel like chatting. I'll put your email address on, on your BatGap page. Um, and anything else you want to you wanna say before we wrap it up? No, I just that... Uh... The uh, only thing I would want to say is that I hope that some people find what I've had to say helpful in some way. If not, well, well that's okay too. But I would also encourage people to watch Batgap. I really uh, enjoy watching the videos. And I especially like the a lot of them that, that are not spiritual teachers. Like sometimes you'll have a spiritual veterinarian. Right. That, that or lady, just some... Yeah. Yeah, Probably or just some person. Yeah, it's like I like the idea of people that ordinary people that are awakening and and may not toot their own horn or be making a big splash or doing a lot of videos, but uh, those people I think sometimes have a very uh, interesting background and path, and 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 we we could. Uh, all benefit from from what they've discovered and and thinking about their path because yeah. there's so many it's true so mm -hmm. that's all i'd say is is enjoy bat gap it's a really good service yeah well thanks well I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you i think this has been a lot of fun and it, you know we're kind of on a similar wavelength in many ways so it's been real easy for me to talk to you and sort of embellish each other's ideas um so keep Keep on trucking, you know, keep on writing those blog posts and keep on watching back mm -hmm. app. <laughs> okay, I will, yeah. definitely. All right, well, thanks. And so thanks to those who have been listening or watching. Um, as you must know, this is an ongoing series. And if, you, if you'd like to be notified of future ones, um, subscribe to the YouTube channel and or uh, subscribe to the little email notification thing that you'll find on batgap.com. And check out the other menus there. And uh, see what we have to offer. So, see you from the next one.